Well, I've decided to increase U.S. support for local forces fighting ISIL in Syria. On a mission to destroy ISIL, the U.S. is sending additional non-combat troops to Syria. What difference, if any, will the extra 250 soldiers make? Will they affect the outcome of the civil war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Martine Dennis. Barack Obama has made the case again and again that sending ground troops to Syria would be a mistake. Instead, the U.S. president has favored a combination of airstrikes and military advisers on the ground to help U.S. allies in Syria repel ISIL. Now, the deployment of so-called non-combat troops is about to get larger. An additional 250 special forces bringing the total to 300. Here's the president's reasoning for the reinforcement. Right now, the most urgent threat to our nations is ISIL. And that's why we're united in our determination to destroy it. And all 28 NATO allies are contributing to our coalition, whether it's striking ISIL targets in Syria and Iraq, or supporting the air campaign, or training local forces in Iraq, or providing critical humanitarian aid. And we continue to make progress, pushing ISIL back from territory that it controlled. And just as I've approved additional support for Iraqi forces against ISIL, I've decided to increase U.S. support for local forces fighting ISIL in Syria. A small number of American Special Operations Forces are already on the ground in Syria, and their expertise has been critical as local forces have driven ISIL out of key areas. So given the success, I've approved the deployment of up to 250 additional U.S. personnel in Syria, including Special Forces, to keep up this momentum. They're not going to be leading the fight on the ground, but they will be essential in providing the training and assisting local forces they continue to drive ISIL back. Well, we've been speaking to a spokesman for the main opposition group, the High Negotiations Committee, the HNC, Salim Muslet, and he said President Obama's decision to deploy 250 more troops to fight Daesh in Syria is a good step. But Syria will not be free of terrorism until we see the end of the Assad regime's reign of terror. We need help in freeing our country from Assad as well as from Daesh. And of course, everyone knows that Daesh is the same as ISIL. So where does the fight against ISIL currently stand? Last month, Syrian government forces, backed by Russian air power, forced ISIL fighters from Palmyra. Now, their retreat from the city, which is famous for its ancient ruins, was considered an important and symbolic victory for the Syrian government. Syrian forces also won back Kariatan, a town to the west of Palmyra, less than a week later. At the same time, in southwestern Syria, rebels successfully resisted ISIL's efforts to expand their territory in Daraa province. Now, ISIL has been making small gains elsewhere, mainly along the northern border with Turkey. On Sunday, ISIL launched rockets across the border into Turkey itself, into the city of Kilis. That's where many Syrian refugees are taking shelter. OK, we can bring in our guests now. Here in the studio, we have Mawan Kawalan, a Syrian academic and writer. In London, we have James Denslow, a Syria analyst. In Washington, D.C., Lawrence Korb, a former Assistant Secretary of Defense in the United States. Welcome to you all. Uh, starting with you, Lawrence, in Washington, D.C., um, give us a bit more about the rationale uh, behind President Obama's decision to bolster forces in Syria, because they are on the ground, even if they're called special forces, and there's only 250 of them. Well, <clears throat> I think the president in his trip both to the Middle East and to Europe is trying to get the allies to do more to fight ISIL. So this is one way in which he can say, well, we're also stepping up our efforts. He also wants to send a signal to the Russians and the Syrians that we need to fight ISIL rather than uh, uh, fighting the so-called uh, moderate opposition. And you're at a turning point, particularly in Iraq now, where they're trying to take back Mosul. And with the forces in Syria, they'll prevent 
the ISIL from reinforcing Mosul if that's what they would, uh, that's what they would like to do. And Mawan here in the studio with me. President Obama, of course, was here in the GCC region before going on to Europe and making this announcement. What was the message that he got from Gulf leaders? Well, I think uh, here, I mean, there has been uh, indeed a few differences uh, between the United States and the GCC countries uh, in, in the way that they see uh, security concerns in different ways in the sense that President Obama seems to be single-mindedly occupied with the war against ISIL. Although, I mean, he stated uh, previously that uh, ISIL is a tactical threat. The GCC countries are mainly concerned about Iran and Iran activities in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, and in other places. So that thing, I don't think that the two sides actually, they managed to have like uh, an agreement on uh, which one should we deal with, especially the GCC countries are saying ISIL is the outcome of Iranian policies in the sense that sectarian policies in Syria and Iraq has led to the rise of ISIL in the first place. And unless actually we, we fight back, I mean, these policies, these sectarian policies, we are not going to succeed in eliminating ISIL, especially when you have uh, most of the Sunnis in Syria and Iraq excluded, marginalized, and hence ISIS, uh, ISIL actually is having uh, a recruitment, uh, uh, is, ha is having a huge pool of recruitment amongst uh, Sunnis in these, in, these, in these countries. So I think this is a very important point that was made during the meeting between President Obama and GCC, uh, GCC leaders uh, during the Riyadh summit. And James in London, such an intricate web of, of rivals and alliances on the ground, can the Americans really separate out uh, their priority insofar as they, their stated aim is to degrade and destroy ISIL, but can they really limit their activities to battling against this armed group and, and, not, uh, and resist getting involved in combating Syrian government forces? I think it's a very important question. I mean, the Syrian crisis is a, a Russian doll of uh, interconnected global, international, regional and local uh, fights. And I think while we focus on the, the US-led coalition operation Inherent Resolve against ISIL, we at the same time have a, a very much connected conflict against the regime and its allies, uh, which is still ongoing, and despite the uh, the cessation of hostilities that is now two months old. So I think, as your guest in Washington alluded to, the introduction of uh, a larger number of soldiers to a small footprint does not only provide direct support against ISIL at a time in which they are tottering somewhat. I was at an event last week where the US envoy uh, on the operations against ISIL spoke of three lead uh, sorry, a leader being killed every three days from ISIL, senior leaders, but also the fact that uh, we do have a f further leverage the Americans can play vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in Geneva and the Russian involvement. And Lawrence, so 250 additional special forces being sent uh, into Syria, when does uh, a force on the ground become a ground force? They're in the uh, on the ground, they're in Syria, they're operating there militarily. What exactly are they expected to do and will it in fact change the military operation? Well, <clears throat> what they're going to do is work with those forces in Syria that are fighting ISIL, not the ones that are uh, going after the government. They'll train them, they'll help them use the equipment that's being furnished from countries uh, but, but outside. But this is, this uh, is uh, uh, outside, sorry uh, to interject, Lawrence, but isn't this uh, the particular difficulty? Isn't it almost an impossible task? Uh, for any American forces involved on the ground in Syria to be able to direct their activities solely at one particular enemy, given the, the myriad of operators on the ground? Well, there's no doubt about the fact it's complicated, and if the forces are threatened, I think, by the government, they will help them. But when we use the term ground forces in the United States, what we're talking about is large d combat formations like divisions and brigades which we used when we went into <coughs> Iraq and, and, and when we had the surge in Afghanistan. We have special forces all over the world. I mean, just last week, they came out with a report that said they're in Somalia, they're in Uganda, they're in several countries uh, <coughs> in Africa. So they can do this without directly confronting 
uh, large numbers of uh, forces on the other side. And politically, it plays better at home because these special forces very rarely have large numbers of, of casualties. And that's what Americans are focused on when it comes to dealing with this part of the world, given what we've been doing for the last uh, 14 or 15 years. And James, in London, is this a mere gesture, do you think, then, in order to appease, reassure uh, uh, President Obama's GCC allies? Or is there something more practical, more tangible, uh, more of an advantage that can be gained militarily by the activities of this, this group of special forces? I mean, what exactly will they be doing on the ground? Well, the situation on the ground is, is somewhat fluid, and you have to look at the map of who controls what to realize that. I think uh, these forces clearly are providing some benefit to date, the 50 that are there, hence the reason for uh, providing more. Um, but I think the key question is sort of what happens next? I mean, what happens, say, for example, if uh, ISIL is pushed out of Raqqa? Uh, who is expected to control that city. And it almost seems inevitable that at some point, unless the peace process in Geneva can deliver a transition that people agree on on both sides, that there will be a sort of coming together or a, a conflict of sorts between US-trained or US-backed forces and uh, Syrian regime or Syrian regime allies. And I think it's interesting to sort of uh, be a fly on the wall on Russian-US discussions as to sort of dividing out who's doing what. Because let's not forget, the Russians have been saying that their campaign in Syria has been largely based against ISIL, yet the percentage of airstrikes they've conducted tend to be against other groups, and I think that's where the real murkiness occurs. And uh, Marwan, let's uh, look at the Geneva side of this uh, complex scenario. Uh, we've had the HNC, the umbrella group of Syrian opposition, walking out and saying they're not taking the Syrian government seriously. They're not prepared to negotiate while people on the ground are being killed in such vast numbers. Clearly, the cessation of hostilities has been used by the Syrian government Absolutely. and its Russia to seize more ground and uh, to further its military aims. Absolutely. And this is what makes actually the opposition in a very awkward position in the sense that uh, they believe that the Americans, the only thing that the Obama administration is concerned about is not the outcome of the Syrian civil war, is not the conflict maybe in Syria, it's mainly the war on ISIL. And as long as the war on ISIL is not disturbed, so everything is fine for the Obama administration, at least this is the, the, the general the understanding uh, within the Syrian uh, uh, opposition. Uh, and the Syrian opposition also believe that the cessation of hostility uh, uh, is the main concern of the uh, of the Obama administration in the sense that they don't, they don't want the regime and the opposition to fight one another. They want them both actually to focus, to stop fighting one another as if there is no political crisis in Syria and they focus mainly on the fight against, against ISIL. This is something that is very, in my opinion, is putting also the Syrian opposition in a very awkward position because they are having their uh, uh, the, the, the armed opposition groups on the ground putting huge pressure on the delegation in Geneva saying that look we are getting killed almost every day by the regime and the regime is bombing us every day uh, claiming that these positions are belong to Daesh or to an Nusra to uh, uh, extremist or jihadist groups whereas I mean the opposition is mainly fighting the, the, armed, the, the armed groups on the ground so I think it's a very it's a very awkward position here and uh, uh, I think many people believe that the decision of hostility will actually collapse maybe maybe soon if uh, if the Americans and the, the Russians don't rush actually to try and risk Well, it. in fact, uh, Stefan de Mistura said um, that the cessation of hostilities is in great trouble if we don't act quickly. So what exactly do you think, Mawan, needs to be done in order to fulfill uh, the request of de Mistura and some quick action which needs to happen now in order to rescue well, I think this it's fraying... Really cessation yeah it's mainly something between that the russians and the americans must work out because when there was this agreement between president obama and president putin during that famous f phone call on february 22nd i think there has been three weeks of almost total uh, uh, secession of, of hostilities because the two sides were able actually to put pressure on their own allies on the ground in order to stop the fighting and focus mainly, as I said uh, before, on, on ISIL. Well, I think because there hasn't been much uh, progress uh, in the latest meeting between John Kerry, I guess, and President uh, Putin, I think uh, 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 the, the secession of hostilities started to have some troubles and we, we managed to see it actually over the past, over the past couple of weeks. James, so do you think then that the introduction of this extra uh, batch of special forces will 
change the, the, the military situation on the ground? How will it uh, affect the military operation? I don't think it's a fundamental game changer, although it might, as you say, take advantage of the momentum that is suddenly reducing ISIL's capacity currently in Syria. I think what it does reflect, as Lawrence said, is a greater investment from Washington into the Syrian situation. And let's not forget that Obama is in his last days as a president, and his successor, say, for example, if it's Hillary Clinton, has already spoken about uh, sort of larger possibilities of involvement and perhaps no-fly zones or safe havens within the north of Syria, something that several other European leaders are pushing. So uh, I think this is another sort of moment in the Syrian conflict, uh, but I think ultimately, as Marwan said, the Geneva process is where our eyes should perhaps be more focused on. And if that cannot deliver some more substantive gains, we have, let's not forget the cessation of hostilities saw 80% reduction in, uh, in deaths, and it's seen large convoys of aid get into places like Rastan, the largest ever convoy last week, 65 trucks. But there are still nearly half a million living in besieged areas in Syria. And if the uh, basic humanitarian aid issue can't be resolved, then how can wider problems like the future of Assad or Syria's constitutional future be truly agreed on. So I think that's where we should keep our eyes focused on. And uh, Lawrence, how worried are uh, the Americans and the American allies about the movement of uh, artillery and such by the Russians to the northern part of Aleppo province, uh, outside of the city of Aleppo? Uh, it points, doesn't it, does it not, to uh, a battle, a battle supreme in a way for the city of Aleppo, which we know is very, very important indeed. Well, as was pointed out, the American position, which at one time was Assad must go, basically now is let's stop the civil war so we can all focus on ISIL. <clears throat> so basically that's what they're trying to get everybody to do. And as my colleagues have pointed out, it's really going to be Russia and the United States can, that can make this uh, ceasefire uh, stop there. And remember, the Russians need to be concerned that if ISIL is not defeated, given the problems they have in Chechnya and they've had over the years, they could inspire people uh, in Chechnya to, uh, you know, to cause problems for the Russians. So they do have an incentive. The Russians are spending an awful lot of money, which they really don't have, to uh, continue uh, in this uh, battle against these, uh, uh, the moderate opposition rather than ISIL. So I do think that it's really going to be up to the great powers to do it. As you point out, yes, this was significant what happened. We know that the Russians, despite what they say, are focusing more on the rebels fighting Assad than ISIL. So we've got to get them to really begin to focus on ISIL if we're going to make a significant difference here. I think it's very important to, uh, to notice that you cannot actually defeat ISIL unless you, st you stop the civil war. And you can't stop the civil war as long as Assad remains in power. So things are so uh, intertwined here to the extent that it's very difficult actually to have one not actually solved without actually dealing with the other. So I don't think how that's going to work out um, uh, or how that, because um, uh, when, when they started talking about, for example, uh, they are trying to find solutions to problems that are not pleasing almost everybody. Uh, last week, uh, uh, John Kerry was talking about uh, giving priority to amending or rewriting the Syrian constitution, and by uh, by that trying to reduce the uh, 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 the authority of Bashar al-Assad, but keeping him maybe and not talking about his future, not talking about his fate, because as he as he recognized, it's going to be very difficult to remove him at this particular stage because of the, um, the Russians and the, the Iranians are resisting that. But on the other hand, it's very difficult actually to go and say that the power of Bashar al-Assad is actually linked to the to the constitution because he is not ruling the country by constitutional. Uh, 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 authority. He is ruling the country because he's acting very much like like a head of a militia. So here actually is very difficult to buy these arguments and to try to to convince the opposition actually that may, maybe maybe we should go and try to focus on this particular issue or try to solve it this way rather than asking Bashar al-Assad to leave. So I think it's 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 a bit dodgy. It's a bit difficult actually to. So it's even more difficult than than uh, we originally outlined, isn't it? And James. I'm imagining that uh, 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 a president who's in his final months of office is, is not going to want to get further engaged, further drawn into what, as Marwan has described, is a, is a double whammy, effectively. You cannot solve the situation in Syria without solving the, uh, the civil war and ISIL, perhaps simultaneously. 
I think Obama said something very interesting in the last few days, that there are no good options in Syria. And I think that really is the managing of expectations towards the conflict. The American public is not interested in any serious investment of U.S. resource into that country, nor body bags coming out of it. And I think ultimately he's maintaining a process by which others, namely the Russians in this case, tend to be making the weather. And I think that's not going to change in the immediate future. ISIL, of course, are a bit of a, an unknown quantity at times. And I think it will be interesting to see whether further progress can be made made in the battle against Mosul, because in Iraq you have a clear set of strategy, support the government to retake ISIL territory. In Syria it's not about supporting the government to retake ISIL territory, instead it's about this rather sort of uh, unknown quantity of the right rebels and whether they can be sustained in a longer term way. So I think uh, Obama will very much hand this conflict over to whoever succeeds him in the White House, and the issue will remain uh, still a critical one. And Lawrence, uh, is it fair to characterize the Obama presidency then as one in which uh, the United States has made a, uh, a pivot, if you like, a pivot away from the Middle East, uh, uh, at the beginning of, a, of a, a broader disengagement, the end of Pax Americana? Well, I think I would characterize it as we're not going to intervene in any more civil wars. Obviously, we, uh, to overthrow dictators, we did it in Iraq, and that didn't work out too well, even though we occupied the country. And then, of course, Obama has admitted he's made a mistake in Libya. So there's no way that he will get involved in, uh, <clears throat> in the civil war. And I think what he would like to do before he leaves office is to take back Mosul. If they can take back Mosul, then he can say he's made progress in degrading, uh, degrading ISIL, but this struggle is going to go on for, for quite a while. But as uh, James pointed out, there's just no way he's going to send thousands of American troops into another, another civil war or another uh, a country to try and get rid of a, a dictator, and they'd be more than happy to leave Assad in office and set up some sort of transition or internationally supervised election, some sort of way in which he can say, well, we're moving in the right direction. And Marwan, at this stage then, what does it take uh, to get the HNC back on board, back in Geneva, uh, pursuing the talks with Stefan de Mistura as the interlocutor. What does it take? What do they need to well, do I th that? I think they need at least to look uh, in front of their supporters on the ground that they managed actually to stop at least the bombing by the regime on the positions of the opposition and on civilians. Like, for example, over the past couple of days in Aleppo, I mean, tens of people, civilians actually, w were killed by this uh, uh, aerial uh, bombardment by the regime uh, of the city. So it's very difficult for them actually to stay in this negotiation process while their own people are getting killed. So, just to be the clear, ground. then, this, this, uh, so ramp, this must ramped, stop. ramped up fight against ISIL doesn't actually encourage the Geneva process at all? Not at all, if you don't address the main question, because ISIL is not the cause of the Syrian, of the Syrian conflict. ISIL is the side effect of the Syrian conflict. So if you are dealing with the side effect of the Syrian conflict, we are not solving the issue here. This is what the opposition is saying. But if we stop this civil war, if we manage actually to find a transition uh, amid this mess, yeah, and then we can actually go all together and fight ISIL and finish it off. I mean, that is the argument. But uh, as long as we are focusing mainly on ISIL, as the Obama administration is doing right now, we are going nowhere. And this is something, as we've already established, uh, first of all, to you, James, and very quickly, this is something that nobody internationally is going to have the appetite for. So this is effectively kicking the can down the road. Well, it looks like it, although there are some things we don't know. I mean, it, there's a huge discussion still ongoing as to whether uh, Syrian moderates will be provided with uh, man pads, the ability to shoot down aircraft. And apparently people are looking into technical solutions as to whether those man pads can be limited in terms of GPS to just operate in Syria or be controlled remotely. That could be a game changer to the use of helicopters and barrel bombs, which could affect things we don't know yet. And that could explain perhaps why these people are coming into the arena of war. So there are some things that the fog of war will not yet reveal reveal as to what exactly these forces are doing. Okay, gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. Sorry I couldn't come to you, Lawrence. We've run out of time for the final word. But James Denzo in London, Lawrence Korb in Washington, D.C., and, of course, Marwan Kabbalan here in Doha. Thank you all very much indeed. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by going to the website aljazeera.com. For more discussion, should you want it, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. But from me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now. <laughs>